a baby book. And if Mary had a baby book, we are certain certain things would be in it. Uh, one of the things would be that Jesus was, um, she would have said that, Jesus, you are my miracle baby, because truly he was. The power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed her so that what was conceived within her was of the Holy Spirit, whose father was God the Father, and so this one to be born would be God the Son. Coming in the flesh, as John would say later, that he tabernacled or he pitched his tent among us. The body was the tent, and the person inside the tent was the second person of the eternal trinity. This truly was a miracle baby like no other baby. Another thing we noticed that would, be, would have been placed in that baby book would have been the family tree. And we went, chased that thing down, and we saw how incredible the family tree of Jesus was just two weeks ago. And then last week, we, we saw how in that baby book, there would have probably been some remarks from Dad, uh, a little bit of uh, Dad's perspective. And if you recall, Dad was kind of uh, floored. Uh, the gal that he was engaged to all of a sudden was showing, and uh, he knew he wasn't the dad. And so uh, he was going to do what a good godly man would have done back in that day. He was going to divorce her. You see, in the engagement period was part of the marriage process. Once you engaged, you had vowed to be wed, and that engagement could only be broken by a divorce. And he was thinking of divorcing her because he knew that the child was not his. Until there was an intervention by the angel in a dream that said, don't be afraid to take her as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And he did exactly what the angel said. I'm thinking that one of the things that would have been in the baby book is also uh, they would have listed the timing, the birthday, and the place of birth. Now, I would assume that everybody here knows their birth date. How many know their birth date? Those of you that didn't raise your hand, what's the problem here? <laughs> How many know where you were born at? All right, you know the city, right, the state. How many know which hospital? All right. Yeah. How many were born at home? Oh, we got a few here. Yes, yeah, awesome, great. I was born at Woman's Hospital. I thought, that's an unusual place for a boy to be born. My doctor was a woman doctor, Dr. Thuman. Uh, she was a Jewish doctor, a lady. And uh, so she, she delivered me, and she made house calls back in the day. She still made house calls. And she actually came to the house to check up on my mother. And my mother was misbehaving. She was supposed to be in bed, but she was up sewing. She had to quick run and send somebody else to the door because the doctor was at the door. My, how things have changed, haven't they? What professionals still make house calls? Oh, pastors do, yes. <laughs> yes, pastors do, pastors do. Anyway, in the book would have been the birth date and the birthplace. And so I want to jump into the scriptures because it's in there. It told 700 years before Jesus was born. It was predicted the location where he would be born. There was this prophecy in the book of Micah. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clan of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. King James says, from everlasting because this is the second person of the eternal trinity. It's predicted exactly where he would be born. In Bethlehem. Now, for that, that, that creates for us a problem. You see, we find in Luke chapter 2, we find that Joseph was from Nazareth in Galilee. That was... Uh, in the northern regions of the country, and it was considered a little more backward. The more sophisticated people were down in Judah, in Jerusalem. And so it says, but Bethlehem was just south of Jerusalem, and that would have been a span of about mm, 90 miles away. So the angels have appeared to both Mary and Joseph, saying that you're going to have a, a child that's going to be by the Holy Spirit, a miracle baby, and, uh, but you're 90 miles away from the destination of where you're supposed to be to give birth to the baby. 
The angel didn't tell him that. But that's where Nazareth is, 90 miles away. So how is this problem resolved? Well, it's resolved with God providentially orchestrating all things. Now, providence is not a word that you find in the Bible. It's one that theologians have coined to to describe what goes on. You see, after God created the entire universe, he didn't stop exerting his powers. He continues to run his universe so that it, it goes to the intended destination. So I put a formal definition up here. Providence is that continued exercise of God's divine power by which he runs the entire universe in such a way that everything fulfills his intended purpose. Now that's a lot. Can I make it a little simpler? Sure. He's got the whole world in his hands. Isn't that that amazing that we can shorten all these great deep theological things into a song? He's got the whole world in his hands. And if you, if you do the song, he's got the itty-bitty baby. He's got, I mean, he's got everything. Everything is in his hand. And he is controlling it. That's exactly what this doctrine of the Bible is saying. God, who created everything, didn't wind it up like a clock, walk away and say, I'll see you in a few thousand years. He is actually the one who is running it. In fact, without him, it would not even exist. In him, we consist. It's running, it's operating according to his plan and his purpose. He's got the whole world in his hands. Now, there's an example of this in another Joseph. There's a Joseph in the New Testament who's uh, the husband of Mary, but there's also a Joseph in the Old Testament. And the Joseph in the Old Testament was kind of a spoiled brat. He was. He was a tattletale. That's exactly the way the story starts out. Joseph was tattling on his older brothers, and they did not like it. Now, it doesn't tell us what he told, what they were doing, but they are obviously really upset and angry about this because they'd like to kill him. Now, if any of you have had a sibling, you've probably had a brother at one time where you said, I'm going to kill you, and you didn't mean it. But these brothers, they hated him. On top of that, on top of that, Joseph, Joseph has a little bit of pride and arrogance because he has a dream. And in his dream, he tells his brothers, and it's not so much that he had the dream because God gave him the dream, but it's how he told it that made the situation even worse. He had this dream uh, that there were 10 sheaves of grain, you know, the gathering of the grain, they have these sheaves of grain, and they were all bowing down to him as a sheaf of grain. And he tells them, yeah, yeah, you're all bowing down to me. And they got upset about that. What, we're going to bow down to you, our little baby brother? That's not happening. And he had a second dream, and he said, oh, there were all these stars in the sky, 10 of them, that's you, and then the sun and the moon, <clears throat> and all those stars bowed down to me, the star. Oh, my goodness, I'm the star? <sighs> and they were really upset. On top of that, Joseph was his dad Jacob's favorite son, his favorite son. And it was obvious, it was on display because he made him this, and you know it, the coat of many colors, an ornate coat that he wore and it set him apart from all the others and the other brothers hated him. If you want to make your kids hate each other, have a favorite. It really works. One day, Jacob says, hey, Joseph, I want you to go out to your your brothers that are taking care of the flocks out at Shechem and and check on them. And so on the way, his brothers see him coming. How could they miss him? Here he is in his multicolored coat. It's ornate. He stands out. It's glistening in the sun. They see him coming. And they they, they organize a plan. Let's let's get him and let's kill him. We'll throw him in an empty cistern. And and they, they hated their brother. And so when they arrive, they're ready again, but Reuben steps into it. He says, whoa, whoa, throw him in the cistern, but don't kill him. And he's thinking, later I'm going to come back, get him out of the cistern. So they throw him in the cistern. Reuben takes off, taking care of the flock. The others are hanging around, and just so happens at that time, a group of Ishmaelites and Midianites come by, and the brothers say to each other, hmm, what good would it do if we kill him when we can make 20 shekels off of him So let's sell him to slavery to the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. And that's exactly what they do. They take the 20 pieces of silver, exchange they give the brother, 
and the brother is now captive and he's being taken down to Egypt where he will be auctioned off for another prophet. When he gets down to Egypt, he is auctioned off to a, a, for a prophet, but it's at this point in the story I, wanna, I, I just want to jump in and, and, and hit you with a Bible verse. Because much later, Joseph is going to say this about his brother. You see, God is in control of everything, everything. The fact that his brothers hated him, that was in the plan. The fact that his brothers would want to kill him was in the plan. The, the fact that his, his brothers sold him into slavery to Midianites and Ishmaelites who just so happened to be coming by at the time when they wanted to kill him but thought they could make a profit off him, it was all in the plan. Later, this is what he says. As he reconnects with his brother, he says, And now, do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God set me ahead of you. Wow, what, what an attitude. Often we say, why is this happening to me? You ever said that to yourself? God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan. So he gets down into Egypt and he's sold to this guy by the name of Potiphar. Now, Potiphar is, uh, you know, he, he's like uh, in the courts of the Pharaoh himself, and, you know, he, he, he's a wealthy man, and he's got lots of servants, and pretty soon, the passage it says in, in Genesis that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. So everything he does is being blessed. Potiphar notices everything that Joseph does is being blessed, and so he puts him over all the servants, in fact, he puts him over everything, his finances, everything. The only thing that's exempted from him is Potiphar's wife. He said, she's off base, she's mine. That's the way every husband should feel. Hey, she's off base, she's mine. And, and so he said, everything. And so, but Potiphar's wife looks at Joseph, and he's a handsome guy. And she says to him, come lay with me. Come sleep with me. And he said, how in the world could I sin against God and my master? He's put everything into my care, everything in this household. He trusts me with everything. And the only thing is you. He said, no, I can't. But she pestered him day by day. And one day she grabs his, his garment as he's fleeing. And, and she then screams out to all the other servants. They come running in and said, he tried to rape me. Falsely accused. When Potiphar gets home, tells the story, produces the, his cloak because she grabbed it when he was running and leaving. And so she, he has him placed in prison. Wonderful plan you have for me here, Lord. You see, just because God has a plan for your life doesn't mean everything is going to go easy and well. Doesn't mean your health is always going to be good. Doesn't mean all your finances are going to be great. Doesn't mean all your relationships are going to be splendid. Doesn't mean any of that. The Bible says that God was with Joseph, who's falsely accused, serving out time in a prison. God was with him there. God was with him there. You can read it in Genesis. While he's in prison, there's two other guys that are in prison with him. The one is called a butler in the King James. He's actually the cupbearer. You see, the king would have a cupbearer. And before he would drink anything out, out of the cup, the cupbearer would have to taste it. Yeah, just in case there was poison in it. Yeah, he, you have the first swig. Yeah, every time I open up a pop for my wife, I say, you want the first swig? <laughs> She's my cupbearer. So he, he falls from grace with the, the pharaoh, the king. There's also the chief baker. Of course, he's, he's the chef, all right? But, but he falls out of grace with, with Pharaoh the king, and they're both thrown in the prison with Joseph. And they both have dreams. i got to shorten the story. We'll be here all day. It's a beautiful story. The cupbearer has this dream that there's a vine, and, and, and it's, the grapes are being wrung, squished, squashed, and he's got his cup below it, and it's catching the wine, and, uh, it's a, and there were three, three, three branches of it. The baker has this dream that he's got three baskets of bread on his head, and he's carrying them, in, you know. And there are birds coming, and they're eating off of the top and eating, eating the bread. 